Thank you very much indeed, uh, Felix, for those very kind words of introduction. It is indeed a pleasure and a privilege to be asked to speak at this symposium. And my topic is a new thoracoscope for the pulmonologist. And I'm going to focus on patient selection and procedural benefits. My name is Mohammed Munawar. I'm from Preston in the UK. And I'm going to cover this presentation under the following headings. First, initially, I'm going to cover a few theoretical aspects and then very briefly describe the practical step-by-step -step guide to semi-rigid thoracoscopy, addressing some specific tips and tricks of the procedure. Then we'll move on to talk about a novel thoracoscope that has been launched, and all of this focusing mainly on semi-rigid thoracoscopy, uh, which is also called flexi-rigid thoracoscopy or pleuroscopy. First of all, theoretical aspects. Thoracoscopy is an essential investigation in this very common scenario when a patient presents with an undiagnosed unilateral pleural effusion. As you see here, this is a massive pleural effusion with mediastinal shift, and the best way forward in this patient would be to perform a thoracoscopy. How do we do this? First of all, we confirm that this is an exudative effusion. This is an undiagnosed exudative effusion then usually we would have done a, carried out a contrast enhanced CT scan as you saw just now. And then you have options. You perform a closed pleural biopsy with a lower diagnostic yield, image guided pleural biopsy, which is helpful, but does not address the entire problem that we are dealing with. And you have thoracoscopy. The advantage of thoracoscopy is that you can perform biopsies, place a chest drain, and also complete thoracoscopic pudrage in the same sitting. Therefore, thoracoscopy has become very popular. And in fact, thoracoscopy has been around for more than 100 years. The very first published thoracoscopy was described by a physician in Sweden called Jacobius, and he introduced a cystoscope into the pleural cavity and was amazed at the quality of the images that he could obtain during the procedure. In addition, in those days in the pre-anti-TB treatment era, he was able to also break down additions very effectively and thus thoracoscopy became well known for as a therapeutic procedure and referred to as the Jacobius operation in those days. Of course, there was a description of thoracoscopy even a, another 50 years prior to that by Sir Francis Cruz in Dublin. Thoracoscopy, as it's known for more than 100 years, has only been practiced through this scope called the rigid thoracoscope. And this is, remains one of the most extensively used versions of the procedure across the world. And no doubt, it has a very high diagnostic yield, well over 95%. And even in people who have had a negative pleural biopsy, thoracoscopy can lead to a very significantly improved diagnostic yield. So this is rigid thoracoscopy, widely practiced. And this continued until 2002, where a group of operators, including Professor Felix Hurt and Armin Ernst, uh, published an experience with a novel thoracoscope in the plural space and described that you could get very good views inside the plural cavity. You can also carry out pleurodesis in the same procedure, diagnose the effusion, and the images were very good as well. So much so in an editorial, Praveen Mathur famously described subsequently that the ease of use of this new instrument and its compatibility with the existing bronchoscopy equipment will open the door for pleuroscopy to become a more commonly utilized procedure in pulmonary practice. So this led to a wider use of thoracoscopy. However, in some countries, as in the UK, you could not use the existing semi-rigid thoracoscope because it was not autoclavable. We were able to evaluate uh, this thoracoscope with the autoclavable newer version of the thoracoscope from 2004 to 2008, and then it was launched in the UK and also published in the European Respiratory Journal. Within a matter of uh, about six to seven years, a number of studies were carried out in this exciting field of semi-rigid thoracoscopy all of which showed that the sensitivity of this procedure was very high at 91%, specificity was 100%, and importantly, 
complications were negligible and mortality was not reported at all with this procedure. So very encouraging results with the semi-rigid thoracoscope. The only problem which we encountered repeatedly was the description that you did not get enough samples. You got only small biopsies with the thoracoscope. And that led to a comparative study. In fact, there were two major studies which are carried out. One elegant study carried out by Alice Rosman and colleagues from Slovenia, comparing the rigid thoracoscope with a semi-rigid thoracoscope for the diagnosis of pleural disease. I say elegant because the primary aim was achieved to compare the size, quality, and diagnostic adequacy of the biopsy specimens. In addition, they looked at safety and tolerability of both types of procedures. All of this was done by a single operator and the pathologist was blinded to the technique, whether it was rigid or semi-rigid thoracoscopy. And what did they find? Not surprisingly, the rigid thoracoscope provided them with larger pleural biopsy samples. However, when it came to diagnostic accuracy, there was no significant difference between the two techniques, whether it was the rigid thoracoscope or the semi-rigid thoracoscope. And the pathologist also did not find any difference in the quality and interpretability of the specimens. Another study was carried out in Chandigarh in India by Ritesh Agarwal and colleagues comparing the rigid thoracoscope with the semi-rigid thoracoscope and very similar results to what Alice Rosman found. That is, they have larger biopsy size without the rigid thoracoscope, but diagnostic yield wise, there was no statistically significant difference between the two techniques. Interestingly, they found that patients who underwent semi-rigid thoracoscopy required a lower dose of sedation and analgesia, suggesting that this is possibly a more comfortable procedure for the patient. More recently, a smaller rigid thoracoscope, a mini thoracoscope, has been compared with the, the semi-rigid thoracoscope by Karan Madan and colleagues in All India Institute in New Delhi, what is called the MINT randomized control trial, which was presented at the ERS and published subsequently. What did this show? The mini thoracoscope, in fact, resulted in a lower diagnostic yield than the semi-rigid thoracoscope. That's one of the results, one of the important results. And more importantly, it showed that the semi-rigid thoracoscope, although it has a smaller diagnostic yield, the operator rated the procedural pain to be lower in the sense the use of semi-rigid thoracoscope may provide greater patient comfort. So in this study, the semi-rigid thoracoscope was not inferior. The rigid thoracoscope had a lower diagnostic yield and the semi-rigid thoracoscope provided greater patient comfort. Another unique feature of the semi-rigid thoracoscope is the option of using narrow band imaging. How does this help? Of course, when there are large lesions in the parietal pleura, it is not of much use, but when you have diffuse thickening of the pleura, the utility of narrowband imaging stands out. There are a couple of studies, one here described here by Ishida and another one from Nicholas Schoenfield from Berlin showing that the patterns that you see, the capillary patterns may give you an idea whether this is pre-neoplastic and may help you target the pleural biopsies appropriately. So there may be a role for narrow band imaging, but this needs to be studied even further. Other techniques have been used to get a bigger biopsy. And here again, Alice Rosman has kindly lent this uh, video to me. And you can see here the use of cryobiopsy through the semi-rigid thoracoscope. The cryobiopsy helps us when there is diffuse thickening of the pleura to get bigger biopsy samples. So cryobiopsy has also been studied in a small studies so far. It is feasible, it's said to be safe, and may give us a bigger biopsy sample. But is it necessary is the question. Most recently, this group from uh, Amsterdam, Jokernema's team, have shown that you could use a confocal laser endomicroscopy uh, needle or tool to guide you to take biopsies, not just in the bronchoscopic world, but also in the pleura. So yet another innovation potentially in the field of fluoroscopy. So that was a brief overview of theoretical aspects of thoracoscopy and semi-rigid thoracoscopy.
Moving on to some practical points, some tips and tricks when it comes to semi-rigid thoracoscopy. And I'm going to take you some of the essential elements that you need to understand if you wish to perform thoracoscopy. First of all, the equipment, the existing equipment that we use is called a pleurovideoscope. You have the 260 series, you have the 160 series, all of them, essentially the thoracoscope looks and feels exactly like a bronchoscope. The length, working length is 27 centimeter. And the last five centimeter you can see here is flexible. The outer diameter is seven millimeter and the instrument channel is 2.8 millimeter. The angulation upwards is 160 degrees and downwards is 130 degrees. And the beauty is that you can just simply connect it to your standard video processors, which you have in your unit for bronchoscopy. And so far, the ones that we've used have been autoclavable. The semi-rigid thoracoscope requires only a single operator, a single puncture. There is a dedicated troker, which is used External diameter is 10 millimeters, so the incision has to be just over one centimeter. The internal diameter is 8.4 millimeters. So there is a gap which allows air to enter and prevents not, uh, the re-expansion pulmonary edema. The patient is placed in the lateral decubitus position and simple monitoring is used during the procedure. The procedure is straightforward in the sense you access the pleural cavity, drain the fluid to dryness, examine the pleural surfaces, and take pleurial pleural biopsies. I will show you in a minute the kind of biopsy forceps that we use uh, in our practice. Um, and then, if possible, you are uh, essential, and it looks like the, uh, the pleura has malignant changes, then you do a talc pudrage. Eventually, we place a 24 French drain usually, and the drain is removed about 24 hours after the procedure. Very occasionally, we place an indwelling pleural catheter as well at the end of the thoracoscopy. The most important aspect of thoracoscopy, safety aspect of thoracoscopy, is to learn how to perform ultrasound. Every single operator who is doing any pleural procedure should learn thoracic ultrasound. Why? Because of safety and also accuracy. As you can see here, the diaphragm is seen, and this is the pleural cavity with pleural fluid. So you can accurately then access the pleural cavity if you perform thoracoscope, uh, uh, thoracic ultrasound on the table just before the procedure. The first tip is that you need to know your ultrasound and you need to perform yourself. The second important tip to remember is that perfect sterility needs to be maintained throughout the procedure. The pleural cavity is a completely sterile cavity and therefore it needs to be kept perfectly sterile, the whole environment on the patient and surrounding the patient and the operator. Then you need to learn simple things, which you as a pulmonologist will be used to, that is sedation and local anesthesia. Local anesthesia, we use a 1% lignocaine uh, formulation up to 20 mils generally, step-by-step -step, skin, subcutaneous tissue and so on and after that, blunt dissection and troca insertion. I'm going to take you through this very quickly. Um, this is the local anesthetic technique which is utilized, and then you insert the needle very carefully. You, you confirm that there is pleural fluid. As you can see here, pleural fluid being aspirated, and after that, you make an incision. At this point, you could allow a few bits of uh, mills of air to enter. Then you make an incision, which is just over a centimeter in length, just enough to allow the troca and cannula to enter. Then you do blunt dissection, which can be performed with a straight artery forceps or a blunt pair of scissors. And eventually, you, once you've got to the pleural cavity and you feel the give, then you introduce the troca and cannula. The troca and cannula should go in with straightforward with just a little bit of pressure and with not a great deal of resistance. When you've, once you've done that, you're ready to introduce the thoracoscope. So that's a step by step. And here you see the cannula, you've got access to the pleural cavity. Just to show you some examples now, this is how the thoracoscope is operated, just like a bronchoscope, and you suction uh, the fluid as you go in. Then you look into the pleural cavity 
and you can see a variety of changes. Here in this patient, you can see multiple nodules as you see in typically in uh, tuberculous pleural effusion or in metastatic disease of the pleura. And in some cases, you also use narrow band imaging to get better quality images. So this is an example of white light thoracoscopy. And here you see narrow band imaging uh, being demonstrated during the thoracoscopy. A most important technique to remember when it comes to taking biopsies is the pinch and peel technique. I'd like to spend a little bit of time to demonstrate this. And there is a dedicated uh, thoracoscopy forceps. An important point, a key point, a key trick to remember is that when you're taking biopsies from the, from the pleura, you need to open the biopsy forceps, fix it, anchor it on the pleura, and then once you've held the pleura, you pinch the pleura, you peel the pleura. Essentially, you do not grab and pull like you would do with a bronchoscopic biopsy, but here gently you peel the pleura, and that is called the pinch and peel technique. For the next biopsy, you'll go back and pick up this edge, and then you'll peel the pleura again. So this is called the pinch and peel technique, something you need to observe very carefully, work with your assistant to perform. At the end of the procedure, if it looks like we're dealing with malignant pleural disease, we use a dedicated talc Pudraj kit. Uh, and this kit uh, is aerosolized talc. You can also use powder talc. This is three grams of talc. And I'll show you how the technique, it goes through the working channel of the thoracoscope. You can see the semi-rigid thoracoscope, uh, the flexi-rigid thoracoscope. And then once you insert into the pleural cavity, you go around spraying all over the pleural cavity under direct vision. And you go all over the pleural cavity in a matter of a few seconds, you would have completed thoracoscopic pudrage. So very satisfying, very effective technique for thoracoscopic talc pudrage at the end of the procedure. And finally, once you've done that, you can place a chest strain. And sometimes we also place an indwelling pleural catheter. The point to remember is if you're going to place an indwelling pleural catheter as well, we should not place it through the same port that you've done the thoracoscopy through. You need to place it in an adjacent intercostal space so that it doesn't slip out. And then you place through the thoracoscopy port a chest strain, which you can remove the next day, and the patient can go home with the indwelling pleural catheter. Thoracoscopy is usually performed when there's a significant amount of fluid. However, by using a technique uh, of pleural puncture, usually we use a dedicated bouton needle. You can access the pleural cavity even when there is only pleural thickening or a small effusion. This is an advanced technique. This is for more experienced operators where you induce a pneumothorax and then introduce the, the thoracoscope. For beginners, you should always choose a patient with a large pleural effusion. It's a lot better and it's safer to do so. Finally, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about a novel thoracoscope which has been launched. What is this all about? First of all, I'll go through this thoracoscope. This thoracoscope, a next generation uh, uh, thoracoscope, is called the H290. Why? Because it's high definition. Second, it's got an outer diameter which is larger, three millimeter. Thirdly, its angulation range upwards is 180 degrees. Let's see how this works. So I've mentioned about the HD imaging, high definition imaging, cl delivering clearer, brighter images, and thereby leading to more accurate observation and diagnosis, and potentially therapy within the pleural cavity for palliation, wider angulation range, so it gives you control over the scope inside the thoracic cavity, and makes it possible even to look backwards towards the entry point, which can otherwise miss lesions. And third, I've mentioned about the larger diameter channel, which will allow us to take biopsies with a bigger biopsy forceps, um, uh, which, which we'll show, show you in a minute. Of course, 
like the original thoracoscope with the 260 series, you will also see narrow band imaging compatibility, and you also have a one touch connector like all 290 series scopes. Now let's go through uh, three videos which emphasize these important points and show you the actual uh, thoracoscope in action. So uh, here you can see the thoracoscope I'm picking up uh, and going to demonstrate in a model. And as you can see, this thoracoscope looks and feels exactly like a bronchoscope. It's a little bit shorter and uh, it's very impressive in the sense you've got a slightly wider outer diameter. You've got at the same time, the uh, working channel, the instrument channel being three millimeter as opposed to 2.8 millimeter. The third uh, feature that I mentioned besides the high, def high definition imaging is the angulation, which I'll show you in a minute. The angulation of the thoracoscope, the upward angulation, the downward angulation remains the same, but the upward angulation, which is seen here, degrees. you can see here, 180 degrees upwards. So this is a unique feature, again, of this new thoracoscope. And I'll demonstrate to you in the next video how this will help us. Um, here you can see the upward angulation of this uh, thoracoscope. And besides all this, as I mentioned earlier, you have the ability to connect it to the new system with, uh, which Felix has described, uh, the EVIX X1, and use the BIMAC facility, which we'll see again in a minute. So let's move on to the next video, which shows you the use so, of the thoracoscope, the handling of the thoracoscope into the thoracic cavity. Um, and this is actually a model that uh, we're going to demonstrate to you on. Um, so you pick up the thoracoscope and then introduce it into the pleural really? cavity. Now let's have a look inside this model. And I'm going to introduce the thoracoscope if, uh, through the cannula. And you can see the dedicated trochan cannula. And once we introduce into the thoracic cavity, you go past the cannula. And then once you've gone past, you can have a look around the pleural cavity. Straight down here, you can see the diaphragm, the costophrenic angles, the parietal pleura, the ribs, and as you go around, you can look towards the apex. Now, whilst you look towards the apex, you do get a very clear view, no doubt, but when you switch and use the latest processor, which is the EVIS X1, and switch on the BIMAC, you can see the difference. It becomes a lot brighter and you get a clearer image for the entire thoracic cavity. You can see the lung here, and this is again the parietal pleura and the ribs. And when you get closer to the parietal pleura, you can appreciate the finer details of the parietal pleural lining with the help of this BIMAC. Now, once again, we'll switch off the BIMAC for a second to see, show you the difference. And there it is, without the BIMAC and without the EVIS X1 features. And then if you switch on the BIMAC for the EVIS X1, you can get a clearer view with greater definition. Even without it, you can see that because the scope has got a HD image quality, you get very clear images of the inside of the thoracic cavity. Going around, you can see the costophrenic angle, you can see the diaphragm here, and then the lung and the visceral pleura. So you can go all around. So finally, let's now, see then, how we take uh, biopsies uh, in these patients. So when you talk about upward angulation, as I mentioned earlier, this scope provides you with the opportunity to angulate up to 180 degrees as opposed to 160 degrees with the previous generation thoracoscope. You can see what this provides us with a wider angle, very clear HDMI view, but when you angulate upward, you can actually see the entry point. This we could not do with 
the previous thermoscope, and as a consequence, there was a small risk of missing lesions very close to the entry point, and that has been overcome with the use of the new thermoscope, which has provided a 180 degrees angle, which is the maximum angle that we've seen with a thermoscope. In addition, when you go around the pleural cavity, using the upward angulation will give us a very clear and thorough view of the entire pleural cavity, as you can see here, all around the pleural cavity. So just to summarize then, we have a next generation, latest generation thermoscope, which is called H290, LTF H290. Three important differences. First of all, the HD image quality that you see here on the screen. Secondly, the larger working channel of 3.0 millimeter as compared to 2.8 millimeter, which will allow us to use a larger forceps, which I'll show you in a minute. And thirdly, the ability to angulate upwards towards, towards the entry point because the angulation, upward angulation is now 180 degrees, as you can see demonstrated in this particular clip. So in short, I have taken you through the various aspects of thoracoscopy, the theoretical aspects, uh, some tips and tricks with a practical uh, approach to thoracoscopy, and finally described to you the new thoracoscope, uh, which, is now, which has now been launched. So in conclusion, a new thoracoscope for the pulmonologist, just like any, any, any procedure in interventional pulmonology, requires suitable training of not just the medical, but also the nursing staff. This is a multidisciplinary technique without a doubt to ensure safety and accuracy of the technique. We've got to select the patients carefully, right patient for the right procedure. So this is where thoracic ultrasound makes a, a lot of difference. For safety purposes, you need to do a WHO checklist, both when patients are brought into the unit as well as when they, are, uh, when they finish with the procedure. There is no, absolutely no doubt that sterility is crucial. The most dreaded complication at thoracoscopy is empyema. Adequate sedation and analgesia, again, is incredibly important to ensure that the procedure is safe for the, uh, for the patient. Thoracoscopy, like many patient, many procedure and intervention of pulmonology, needs to be focused on a small number of specialist operators in each unit because you need to do enough procedures on a regular basis. The most important safety tip is to learn ultrasonography, sonography, and perform it on the table to you select the safest possible site to enter the pleural cavity. And every unit should have a bleeding protocol. In the unlikely event, because bleeding during thoracoscopy is not that common, it's in, in, in fact very rare, in the unlikely event, you need to be prepared. Finally, I have described to you the new thoracoscope, which is the H290 thoracoscope. It provides unique features and higher definition imaging, a larger working channel, and therefore we could be using larger biopsy forceps, um, allows you to angulate upwards to 180 degrees and therefore ensures that we do not miss any part of the pleural cavity during the examination, especially areas very close to the entry point of the trocha. I have also shown you the BIMAC facility, which gives us brighter and higher definition images. Many thanks indeed for your very kind attention.